Christian, you, you forgot to mention that I got fired from the White House in the introduction. I didn't. I mean, you could. I mean, you guys are very polite up here in Canada. That would have been fine. Go ahead, Dimitri. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, once again, uh, congratulations to the Toronto Global Forum, uh, in particular to Nicolai and his team. Uh, although I will point out a major flaw in the scheduling of today's luncheon, uh, they chose to allocate 20 minutes to this conversation, and then they decided to put a Greek and an Italian up on stage. <laughs> so we might go a little bit over time, Nicolai. Anthony, uh, welcome to Canada. Um, it's always great to be up here in Canada, Dimitri. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, again, looking at that clock, uh, let's kick it off with Anthony. Who are you, your upbringing, uh, your education? Talk to us about the person, and we'll, we'll just, talk about all the we'll rest just, after. Just 30 seconds quickly on Canada. When I joined Goldman Sachs, I got staffed on the uh, Cadillac Fairview transaction. And so I was living in the Four Seasons Hotel for about four months and working at Eaton Center and I travel to all of your great cities. I'm, I'm one of the few Am Americans from Long Island that have actually been to Regina, Saskatchewan. Can you believe this? Okay, so I mean, you know. But I, I travel the entire uh, country, and so, you know, I'm in love with Canada. I'm not just saying that because I'm here. Um, and I also watch The Handmaid's Tale, so I know I, I, I have a home up here if I need one, so. But, uh, I mean, because you never know what's gonna happen, right? So, but, uh, you know, wh who am I? I'm, I'm a... Uh, I have an improbable life, pretty similar to yours, actually. You know, my, my, parent, my dad was from northeastern Pennsylvania, Italian immigrants. My mom grew up on Long Island. Uh, my, my grandfather was a coal miner. My father and his two brothers responded to advertising to mine sand on Long Island. And since that wasn't going into the ground, they thought that was a good idea. And my dad and his brothers uh, spent uh, four decades plus at a sand mining facility in my hometown of Port Washington. That's all been dug out now, and there's a beautiful golf course there. And so I live two miles from my folks uh, out on Long Island. Uh, I built two businesses, as Christian mentioned, and uh, improbably I entered politics as a result of uh, President Trump and uh, ended up in the White House for 11 days. So that's also, <laughs> it's also 954,000 seconds. Sometimes I have to tell my therapist it was 950 hours, you know, it makes it sound longer, but, but that's me. Still 11 more days than any one of us in this room, so. Hey, hey, by the way, it was a life experience, obviously unforgettable, but I would say that the trials and tribulations of the last three years for me have been an extraordinary rite of passage, uh, both uh, brutal and humiliating at times and unbelievably rewarding at other times, um, but, but very human, it's a very human story. So the UK has a new prime minister, Boris Johnson, the similarities uh, to President Trump. Um, so almost three years into the Trump term, how lasting will his populist legacy be, both domestically and internationally, President Trump's? Well, I think it's a little hard to really assess that from this close vantage point. If he doesn't get reelected, uh, you still are going to have to deal with the afterglow of him and the remnants of uh, nationalism and the forces against globalism, which I believe are disruptive to the society. And you'll have to answer for three and a half decades of establishment, lack of advocacy for a very large group of people. And so the reason why President Trump became president um, is that the people I grew up with uh, sort of feel left out of the political conversation. Uh, Democrats in the United States, Republicans, establishment leaders left a vacuum of advocacy for those people that the president filled. And by the way, Bernie Sanders also was filling that in 2016. And so um, you're, w w no matter what happens to President Trump, if he's reelected or not reelected, uh, there will be an afterglow and remnants of that in the United Kingdom, possibly up here in Canada, uh, and other parts of the Western democracies. How did you first meet President Trump? How did that relationship evolve? Um, you know, you, you, were, you were on air during the election campaign. Well, I, just, I just want to state for the record, according to the President's Twitter account, he barely knows me. <laughs> uh, and I had nothing to do with his election. So if you're mad at me for him being President, I had nothing to do with his election, according to him. Okay, so just, just remember, that's in the presidential record, okay, so just everybody knows that, so. No, but, um, I mean, cool. But uh, I met him 20 plus years ago. I, actually longer than that, it was 1994, so I guess 25 years ago. I was an associate at Goldman Sachs, or I just made vice president, and uh, 
head of the real estate department had asked me to go to a meeting with him. And so I'm all of 30 years old and I'm going into Trump Tower, which incidentally is the exact same office when I got there in the campaign. Um, and at that time, he was trying to refinance some uh, properties to help pay off some of these loans that he had as he was restructuring out of, out of bankruptcy. Um, so I'm sure he didn't remember me from that meeting, but remember he was Donald Trump and I was 30 and he'd written the art of the deal. He was a very well-known person. So I obviously remember the meeting. Um, and then I worked for CNBC for a pretty long period of time and got invited to a lot of the NBC events that were related to The Apprentice. And so got to know him through that. And then I'm a huge sports fan. And so I saw him at Met and Yankee games. But we really didn't develop a relationship until 2012, where then Mr. Trump hosted two fundraising events for Governor Romney, and I was on uh, Governor Romney's uh, finance team. So I got to know him there. Uh, and then very quickly, uh, the Apprentice finale, the morning after, I was invited to breakfast with uh, Mr. Trump. Did, did you see me on The Apprentice last night? I was great. I said, no, I actually didn't see you. He goes, you were the only one. You were the only one. <laughs> and uh, he said, but you know, my television career is over and I'm running for president. And I literally laughed and said, you stole publicity, son. Of course, you're not going to do that. And he said, no, I'm totally serious. I hired this guy, Corey Lewandowski, and he was giving me the whole strategy. And I said to him, well, I was, when you were on The Apprentice last night, I was watching Fox News. You're at 2% in the polls. Well, that's because everybody is just like you. They don't think I'm running. But when I run, I'm going to shoot to the top of the polls and I'm going to stay there until I win. I laughed again, so it just shows you how politically astute I am. And I said, well, I'm already with Governor Walker. I'm very close friends with uh, Paul Ryan. And so I said, I'm already working for Governor Walker. If he drops out, I'm going to be with Jeb Bush. Most of my clients are with Jeb. Um, he says, OK, that's fine. You're a loyal guy. When those two guys drop out, will you come work for me? So what do you think I did? And so I said, okay, fine. And then I was there in a fundraising capacity, but you know we were very short staffed. And so do not underestimate the president. Uh, he's got po unbelievable political instincts. He went from being a business mogul and a reality television star, 17 short months, wiped out 19 establishment politicians, and became the American president. And we did it understaffed. Our staffing was about half of Secretary Clinton's. And our fundraising was about half of Secretary Clinton's. And so, so, you know, he's a formidable guy. And then obviously he got swept into the White House and then the whole trials and tribulations happened. I, I think everybody in this room is asking themselves, why does a reasonable guy like you, why? Why, why would you actually put your time, your energy, so, your effort, your money, your credibility on the line so, for? So it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question, but I would just caution everybody in the room because what has, we have a tendency to think very highly of ourselves, and sometimes we can look at others with great righteousness and great sanctimony. Um, but what I would remind everybody in this room is that we're all coming from a product of our own environment, and we're coming from our ideation of self. And so for me, I'm a product of a blue-collar family. And so um, I wasn't attuned to uh, Mr. Trump in the beginning. I was with Scott Walker and Jeb Bush. I'm more of a political moderate. But when I started going on the campaign with him and I started realizing, oh my God, uh, my dad grew up in an economically aspirational environment with high middle class wages for blue collar people. M many people in America, at least half, uh, there's been a generational transition where those economic aspirations have turned to economic desperation. And so that was attractive. Uh, you could blame me for that, but I'm gonna tell you straight. Uh, I'm a Republican, um, and I thought that the restraint on business through the excess regulation of the Obama administration uh, was unnecessary, and I thought it was going to damage the global economy and the American economy, and so I wanted him to win versus her as a Republican. And then the, uh, the third thing, uh, which again, if you want to be critical of me for, that's totally fine, but I would ask you to read the Washington Post editorial that I wrote a few weeks ago. Um, you're, you're, you're in the situation. You're a blue collar kid that's lived a large part of the American dream. The American president elect is asking you to go work for him. I don't know, if you could turn that down, God bless you. Um, I couldn't and uh, uh, Reince Priebus uh, blocked me at the door. And I, I, I told a group earlier to this luncheon that I'm, I've made colossal mistakes, but the biggest mistake that I made, and this should be a cautionary tale for yourselves 
and for your children and for students that are in this room. Don't, don't put your pride and ego into your decision making. Because once your pride and ego is in your decision making, you start really making bad decisions. And this is right out of Greek tragedy, Dimitri. So uh, when Reince Priebus blocked my original job to be the president's chief networking officer, his office of public liaison, when I had actually met with your uh, uh, ambassador, uh, I called the president. I said, these are two bad guys, Bannon and Priebus. When you need to get rid of them, call me. He called me. Man, I wish he didn't call me, to be honest, but he called me, right? And so guess what I did? I had my pride and ego in it. When your pride and ego is up here, your, your emotions are up here, your intelligence is going this way. And so I made some very colossal mistakes uh, in that process, got fired after 11 days. Um, but I own those mistakes, and uh, I tell kids, own the mistakes that you make in life, be accountable for them. Uh, and the number one thing you have to do when you're making a mistake, and most of us are products of a Judeo-Christian background or perhaps a Muslim background, in each of those religions, there's a redemption component to those things and there's a forgiveness component. And when you're making mistakes in life, the number one thing you have to do is forgive yourself. Otherwise, you're gonna live your life with a millstone of regret and you don't want that in life. So you have to go forward from here, look at where you are, analyze the situation, but uh, Listen, uh, it wasn't just me, Dimitri. There's 62.8 million people, and not just poor people or blue-collar people, but there's a collection of people very similar to me that made that same mistake. Maybe not as publicly profiled as me, but they made that mistake. Are they going to make it again? So we, we were having this conversation earlier. Uh, they may. It's hard to know. Uh, I think the president is in severe mental decline. Uh, and I'm not saying that now because I'm a political adversary or I, I've, I've I disavowed him. I'm saying that objectively, just looking at what's going on. Now, there are liberals in this room or never Trumpers in the room will say, well, why didn't you see that 10 months ago, 15 months ago, two years ago, five years ago? I, I accept that criticism. I'm not here to uh, say that uh, I'm right. I'm here to say that I got it wrong. I now think I have it more right than wrong. But I would encourage everybody in this room to recognize that you're going to have to create an off-ramp for people that got this wrong. Otherwise, they're going to be welded to somebody that they should not be welded to, and it will have Canadian consequences, American continent consequences, North American consequences, and global consequences. And so, so we, have to, we have to fix it. You can get things wrong. I'm an entrepreneur. I, I, if you gave me two years, I could tell you every one of the mistakes that I've made in my career. But what entrepreneurs have to do is they have to admit that they're wrong and make an adaptation and move quickly. And so, you know, I, I'm, I got it wrong. I'm explaining to people why I got it wrong. And I'm, t I'm challenging people to help me get other people onto that off-ramp so that he does not win re-election. If you take away the individual, the personality, the chaos, the Sharpie pens, um, some of his policies are you're good not for America. Mention, you're not going to mention Twitter? I mean, we will throw that in there, too. I mean. <laughs> Some of his policies are, are, are good for, for America. The, the American economy mm -hmm. is doing well, yeah. so mm -hmm. do you prefer having a charismatic, good-looking leader um, who has bad policies? I'm not taking any shots at the prime minister. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a guest here. You know, look, I mean, you know, I mean I, here's what I was saying. Okay, I'm, a <laughs> I'm a Republican, but I'm also a pragmatist, and I'm you know, more of a patriot than I am a partisan. And so... When I read like the Declaration of Independence and it says that uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I don't think that's only for straight people. Okay, so I'm a pro-gay rights activist and I'm a guy that worked with the New York Senate to get that legalized in New York. And I worked with Rob Reiner, the actor and director, to help nationalize that. So, so for me, I'm sort of a socially inclusive person, but I have a Republican idea of what I think should happen to free markets and how to unleash growth and opportunity and lift people out of poverty. But here's the problem with the Republican Party right now. They're spending money like drunken sailors. I mean, they, they, they racked up two and a half trillion dollars of debt. Uh, they controlled both houses last time. Uh, they control one of the two houses, the more important of the two this time. And they're spending hand over fist. So, so to me, uh, there's a fever going on in our society right now. It's almost like a virus or a fever, and we gotta, we, gotta, we gotta cure it, we gotta bring it down. You know, and we've got somebody running the government. You know, if you think of the United States like I do, it's a family. 
And so if you've got a family situation and you've got the patriarch of the family, or it could have been a matriarch that's not well, what do you have to do? You have to intervene. You have to step in there and say, hey, this is not working. Um, and I would challenge anybody in this room that's on a public board or, or in a private company's board, if you saw this sort of activity in the private sector, you'd have to raise your hand and say, excuse me, this, this is not working. We have to find a replacement. And so it's nothing personal. It's just being objective. But if you're asking me the question, does lower taxes work? Does deregulation work? It does uh, to a point. Uh, if you're asking me the question, are there good conservative values uh, in the spirit of J.S. Mill and in the spirit of, of people like uh, uh, Irving Kristol and Milton Friedman? Yes, obviously those things work. We can actually measure those things. But I'm, I'm more about, I'm less about left and right and I'm more about right or wrong. Now, there's some policies that are socially progressive that I totally agree with. So you, you talk about creating an off-ramp. Um, if you were to choose one Republican nominee that could stand in the way of Donald Trump before mm -hmm. the next election and challenge him. And this is off the record, by the way, that this, everything. Yeah, I can tell. It's going to be off the record. I got, I got, I got it. There's the 500 people in the room, but it's off the record. I, of course. I don't know the difference between on and off the record anyway, so it doesn't really matter to me. You, know, so I, you guys have probably figured that out by me by now, about me by now. But who, who, um, who can legitimately, who would you the, support? The, the, the answer is that, uh, it's almost anybody that you could think of that would run in 2024. Anybody, okay? And because let me tell you, all you gotta do is get somebody in there that has that political standing and that political experience, and then the debate will start. And but then once the debate starts, I really do believe the president is a paper tiger and he will fold because the surface number he says it's 94, but it's, it's in the low 70s. But the secondary question is, well, would you choose X, Y, Z, or A, B, and C over him? And you may have read this in Politico this morning. Mike Pence has higher approval rating numbers than Donald Trump. And the, the Trump people were trying to hold that back, and the Pence people pushed it out there. And so, so if somebody challenges him of great standing in the Republican Party, they're going to knock him pretty hard. Who would you recruit? Well, here's the problem. So you're, you're, so you're, you're problem. clearly trying clearly not on, to not clearly, get him reelected. And, and Dimitri Zimmick is a terrific guy, by the way, but it's, it's not off the record. And here's the problem. I'm in discussions right now, intense discussions with several people that are well-known, well-recognized people. And so I don't want to bring any of their names up right now because they're like, okay, what, what, what's this guy doing? You know, when they're ready, and hopefully one or two of them will be. Uh, for 2020? For 2020. Yeah. And by the way, you got about three or six weeks here uh, to make that decision. If you don't make the decision in the next three or six weeks, then it's going to be likely Donald J. Trump, unless the mental decline accelerates on a faster downward slope, at which point somebody like Senator McConnell is going to have to say, whoa, whoa, hold on a second, okay, just talk to Speaker Pelosi. We got to blow you out of here. So either you're going to resign or say you're not going to get reelected because the Sharpie thing is one thing, but you're going to create an international crisis with this nonsense. And there's smart people in this room. They know he has no standing anymore in the international community. He, he, he looked completely out of it at the G7. Um, and I'm about to write an op-ed uh, that explains from my peer group and people that work with me inside the White House and inside the cabinet what he has done to dismantle and disintegrate large parts of the executive branch that were interwoven that need to work with each other to prevent a military crisis, a terrorist crisis, a financial crisis. And so, so you have to look at this objectively. You have to look at this like if you're a VC, private equity guy, entrepreneur, and you guys say, okay, this is a severe problem. If you guys don't want to fix the problem as Republicans and get a new person in there to beat these other people, because I'm a Republican. I believe any of those people that could run in 2024, if you pulled them into 2020, could beat the Democratic field. The country's not ready for this sort of Green New Deal, socialist, you know, horizon, nirvana, nonsense. It's not ready for it. So you could bring one guy in or one woman in, and I think you could, you could do a lot of damage. So 13 I'll, seconds to go in the period. I mean, this is a fast period. Are we'll we to bring the ice thing out to smooth out the ice after this? Or? No. <laughs> Take another so, five. So, so I'll assume that 
no Republican will have the courage to stand up and, and let himself or herself be counted. So then my other question is, which Democrat can beat Trump mm -hmm. and what's the Achilles heel? So I think the polling data right now is sort of circumspect. I mean, it's too early um, and you won't really know that answer, Dimitri, until they have a candidate. And then you have to remember, they have to withstand the bullying onslaught of the president and then nicknaming and all of that stuff. And so I predict that that is a tired act now. Uh, it was very refreshing in 2016 and people laughed about it and giggled and said, oh, this is great. Uh, but I think they're now, I mean, you know, he's called Rex Tillerson dumb as a rock. He called me a dope. He's called this guy a fat slob. I told Anderson Cooper I had to go on the keto diet so he didn't call me a fat slob on Twitter. You know? <laughs> I lost 10 pounds before I went after Trump because I didn't want to be called a fat slob because he's got like seven or eight different things that he uses. You know what I mean? It's, it, and his vocabulary... It's like episode four in the uh, Star Wars movie. You remember when the trash compactors like closing in on each other? That's Trump's vocabulary, right? He's, he's going down to like 500 words now, right? So, I mean, so I don't, I don't think, you know, that stuff is going to work next time. I mean, that's just my personal opinion. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Um, and so you'll have to see who it is that they nominate. You know, I, I, I don't think the country's ready for Bernie Sanders. I don't think the country's ready for Elizabeth Warren. I don't. That's my opinion. Um, but we'll have to see, and we'll have to see where they pivot, you know, as, as things unfold. But here's the thing I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you that you already know, but I'm going to tell it to you. He takes no one's counsel. No one. Is that not odd? Is that not odd to you? He's the leader of the free world. He's the president of the United States. He takes no one's counsel. So if you're giving him trade advice or foreign policy advice or advice on North Korea, he's smarter than the generals and he's a very stable genius and he's taking no one's counsel. Do you think that that would make sense for the leader of the free world, the tied for the largest economy in the world to have leadership like that for the next four or five years? Do you think that's gonna work for the planet or for the nation? Can I say one last thing? I know we got ran out of time. Can I say one last thing? Sure, I'll have one you, more question. Okay. Recession's no problem, okay? We did 12 of those from 1901 to today. Those are like bone breaks. They, they will heal, we have no problem. If you have the leader of the free world creating rancor and dissension and a license to hate inside the great American experiment, if you have that person tearing at the social fabric of the society as its leader, country's first name is United. You have a disunifying leader destroying the social fabric of the country. That is a metastatic cancer. Okay, you may not survive that. Okay, it's not a bloodline, the United States. It's not a lineage. It's an idea. Okay, and Lincoln called it the last great hope for mankind because everybody got accepted. And yes, we fought with each other and we were saying racially nonsense words to each other, but we were rowing the boat together, okay? That's how we got through many of our problems. And so this guy has got to go, you understand that? And if you like his policies, and there's people in this room that I have met that like his policies, and you know what, Dimitri? I like some of those policies. That's why I supported him. If you like his policies, take the totality test and look at what he is doing to the society and choose people and mankind over the policies. You have to do that. You have to do that for yourselves, you have to do that for your children, you have to do that for your grandchildren. And so, I will be working very hard to find a competent and credible Republican to stand in that primary. And if I'm unsuccessful at doing that, we're gonna work on getting him unelected or defeated. But I predict that this will not happen. He will be out of the race by March. That is my personal prediction. And I'm going to hold to that because I think he is in severe mental decline. And I think at some point when he starts really damaging these Republican senators, uh, they're not there yet because everyone's very self-interested. When that happens, they'll pull him. Okay, you want to ask one more question? Last question, or even though there's like probably 20 We're in overtime. I'm we sorry. Can all yes. ask. Uh, would you campaign for Joe Biden if, if no Republican stands in the way? So I only had one press conference in the White House, which was a lot of fun for me because, you know, I would love to answer these people's questions, by the way, but we don't have enough time. But, but I, I have no problem answering people's questions. 
I've had one more press conference than Stephanie, by the way. She's the press secretary. I just want you to think about that. She's lasted 46 mooches right now, <laughs> but she's only had zero press conferences, so it's one nothing so far, right? So, but, but, but here's, here's, here's what I would say to you, okay, is, why are you laughing? It's funny, right? But actually, the problem is it's, it's funny, but it's a little scary at the same time, right? I mean, this is the leader of the free world. So what I said in that press conference, I'll say to everybody here, I'm not going to answer that hypothetical because, you know, I get trained in law school. Don't answer the hypothetical. If you invite me back to Canada and we have a candidate, and that candidate is Joe Biden, and we've had 12, 6, 8 months have evolved, and we're looking at the landscape, and you're telling me that Donald J. Trump is the nominee, and he gets there with this very limited vocabulary and this overzealous bullying, and uh, we've got to see where the Sharpie's going after this. I mean, I'm sure we're going to be using it more. Um, I don't know. But my prediction is that Joe Biden may or may not be the candidate, and my prediction is Trump will not be the candidate. And so we'll have to see what happens. So invite me back, and I'll tell you what I think. Fair answer. You're, you're, you're definitely getting an invitation. So you went to law school with Barack Obama. I did, yeah. Don't tell I that to, story I, that I you shared to, privately? Oh, yeah, that's a funny story. I mean, but also, like, one of my, like, can I tell the Deborah Messing story, too? Is that cool or yeah, no? All right, so, so. Um, it's off the record. Uh, yeah, but it's okay because we ran out of time. I don't want to overstay my welcome. It's okay to tell the story? Is right? Okay, so just quickly. All right, so just quickly. Um, I, I was in law school with Barack Obama. We didn't really know him. And so a couple of buddies of mine came to see me, and they were like, one of our buddies from law school is running for president. And I'm like, okay, great. We want to get a check from you. I said, okay, no problem. I'll give the check. I was very politically agnostic at that time. And so I went to the Metropolitan Club and I met then Senator Obama. And, and I walked over to him. I had the check in my pocket. I said, Senator, I said, we didn't really know each other in law school. I said, but I'm about to write you a big check. Can I lie to people and tell them that I knew you in law school? And Obama looks at me, and he has the best smile in American politics since Jack Kennedy. Okay, that's one of the reasons why he got elected. Right? So he lights up. He goes, if you double the amount of the check, we'll take it back to Hawaii. I thought that was great, right? I mean, that's him, right? That's him, right? So I did. I doubled the amount of the check, okay? So, but I did go to law school with him. I have been invited to more Obama White House Christmas parties than I have to Trump Christmas parties. <laughs> you think I'm going to get invited to any Trump Christmas parties? I don't think so. Okay, so... Last two pieces of story, Rod Rosenstein is one of my best friends. He was in my section at Harvard Law School. And I told the president, Rod's a good guy. He's a boy scout. He's never going to do anything wrong. But he was listening to all that right-wing nonsense, okay? And it turned out I was right about Rod. And I know the guy 33 years. The other very close personal friend of mine is the president and chief operating officer of my company is a guy named Brett Messing. That's Deborah Messing's older brother. See that? And so when I was engaging with the president after he went after me on Twitter, I'm a private citizen, it's okay, I'm an adversary and I'm an outspoken guy, but also remember that the president went after my wife. We just want everybody to know that and go back through his Twitter feed, he attacked my wife. He knew that we were going through a difficult period of time, almost got divorced as a result of my White House experience. We've subsequently patched up our relationship but I just want you to think of the lack of boundaries and the viciousness of this human being. He attacked a suburban housewife on Long Island that's raising two kids, one of which started kindergarten yesterday. So that is the man in the White House. Now, someone will say to me, well, he attacked Ted Cruz's wife. Why weren't you upset about it then or Jeb Bush's wife? I was, actually. I spoke out about it then. You can find that on television. So I'm just letting you know the guy attacks my wife. Okay, no... No problem, but, but I just want you to understand what you're dealing with and who you're dealing with. So now I went after him and explained to people on my Twitter account that bullying is very un-American, that he's un-American. And then we went after my friend Chris Cuomo. I put presidential harassment, right, because he uses that all the time, right? Just let him know he's harassing people. So you're not going to bully a guy like me. I grew up with nothing, and this is a rich kid from Manhattan. I know how to take on this guy, no problem. Not going to bully me. So now... We're in the fight, and my Twitter likes and my retweets are going up exponentially. And they're trying to figure out why that's happening. Does anybody know why that happened? Well, I can explain why. Deborah Messing. We've been friends for 33 years. She's retweeting every single thing that I'm writing. 
Okay, so he's not coming after me because he knows, man, if I come after this guy, you know, he may not be the dope that I described him as on Twitter, and he may take me lights out. So let me go after Deborah Messing. Okay, you see what a low life this guy is? Okay, you guys know he's a low life. Even the people in this room that would have voted for him if they're American or voted for him if they were American, they know he's a low life. They know either like, I like his, he's a low life, I like his policies. Enough, he's a low life, we got, he's gotta go, okay? And we're gonna make that happen, we just don't know how it's gonna unfold yet, Dimitri. Anthony, uh, thank hey, you very much. Great to be here, guys, thank you very much. I wanna end on a note like that. Thank you.